Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read um, with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. This is the spooky episode of I Like to Read um, Halloween and, you know, spooky things or just kind of my bread and butter. Um, feeling the pirate spirit today, just some sort of generic Amazon purchased pirate costume. Um, but for the visual listeners, no, I'm not doing a cosplay or an OnlyFans. It's just, it's Halloween. I mean, um, I'm recording this before Halloween, although it is dropping the day after Halloween, November 1st. Um, it's kind of Halloween weekend. And um, I am a firm believer that like, you know, Halloween is all year um, or Halloween should be all year. We can appreciate Halloween all year. Um, so this is the spooky sode. Um, all of the books that I'm going to be discussing, once again, I am cheating and there's going to be six, um, but they are all in that spooky oeuvre. You know, we got a couple of thrillers. We have um, some nonfiction. We have a really nice assortment of books and they all pretty much just happen to, again, come in with um, library roulette and maybe I'll submit that to Urban Dictionary or like if anyone wants to, my, my coin my little library roulette term. Um... Yes, yeah, so they just all kind of happened to come in around the same time. Most of the ones I'm going to be discussing also came out pretty recently. You know, I'm sure there was some intentionality to them being scheduled for um, October, of course, spooky season, spooky month. Um, but what are your guys' favorite spooky things to do? Um, I am from right outside of Boston. So um, actually growing up, my grandma, um, my dad's mom, and my step-grandpa, my dad's parents were divorced, got remarried, little personal family history. Um, they lived in Salem or like right outside of, they know they lived in Salem for a long time. Um, so naturally, you know, we learn about the witch trials. I was just super intrigued. Um, there was a period of time, I think I was in like fifth grade, um, when I was like into pursuing Wiccanism and, you know, sort of going into different religions. It was never anything like satanic or pagan even, you know, it was very like mother and nature and grounded in that sort of sense and I was young and I was just like you know I did have a little altar but I was also just super into the history of the witch museums like I did all the cliche touristy things there was the wax museum there's the traditional witch museum like in the town old town hall I think um Salem's just a cool place to visit I know that lately pre-corona people have been like hating on it for sort of just like the unappreciation and tourism that they bring um I don't know, I could just be talking out of my ass on that one. I haven't been in a long time. It'd be fun to go back and kind of see some of the cheesiness of that stuff. Um, fans of the film Hocus Pocus will recognize Salem, Mass. <laughs> as the filming location for some of those. Um, yeah, it's just a fun town. I mean, I don't. we don't really have any specific plans for Halloween. I mean, it's COVID. We may be getting brunch with a couple of friends, um, but we're just going to... I uh, Jason hasn't seen Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, so maybe I will show him that one. Um, maybe we'll have seen it at the time of this and at the time of even editing. So, Jason, what did you think? I don't know. We'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> it's also... It's just been like a, a rough... 24 hours 36 hours um yesterday you know we just wanted we just wanted to go to dunkin donuts and the grocery store and my car uh, wasn't working i have a 2007 toyota prius um purchased used from craigslist i'm of the volition you know as long as the car is not a total piece of shit as long as it drives and it's safe and you know it even has some benefits like good mileage and a backup camera then like i'm fine i don't need anything super extravagant and fancy and um i've had quite a few repairs in the lifetime of the car i've had it uh, a little over four years um and just as recently as february there what the brake system <laughs> completely failed when we were about 45 minutes away um from my apartment we were just doing an errand and the car died uh stopped driving in brakes and so that was a fun hefty repair and then yesterday um lucky enough to get it towed thanks triple a Took it to the mechanic, and lo and behold, it needs a new, just regular battery and a timing belt. Um, so nothing too crazy, but you know, still um, a sick, a three-figure unexpected expense. Um, then I also had, took my cat for his routine checkup today. Um, we just do a yearly vet checkup to make sure the little guy's all good. Um, he's been losing hair on his stomach um, recently, I've noticed, and. That's new for him. Um, he's been licking it a lot. I did some research and it doesn't seem anything too crazy. Um, the vet was like, yeah, we'll just give him a steroid shot. We'll give him some antibiotic shots. So like, you know, I was planning to drop about like a hundred bucks, like a normal expense for just like a routine visit. 
Uh, no, I ended up being more close to like 300. I do have pet insurance, so fingers crossed um, that that is covered by it. But um, that's kind of the spooky stories for me. I know there's a lot bigger shit and a lot crazier stuff going on, but it's like I'm all for slasher films and I can, you know, watch people's heads being cut off and murdered. But like you throw me some real life like adult problems and like you spend about over a thousand dollars that you definitely did not plan to spend and you know, now that I have to spend it, would love to have spent it on some other things. Um, but that's like what's spooky and scary for me. Um, just adult life hitting you shit in the fan. I mean, I'm glad my car's okay. I was like freaking out for a little bit that I was like spiraling. I'm like, is the engine completely dead? Like, do I have to get a new car? I was like looking on Craigslist. I'm thinking about like, you know, how am I going to afford car payments and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like free just like in that couple of hours that I'm waiting in between like getting the car towed and knowing something is definitely wrong and just kind of like waiting for them to diagnose it and know what's happening. Um, so I'm going to go pick it up tomorrow morning at the time of this recording having dropped. I will have had it back. Hopefully everything, you know, knock on wood is great and it'll just be another drop in the not insignificant bucket of car expenses that I've had recently. Um, so, um, you know, if you're here for the books, I'm sorry, we're going to get into that. Uh, that was a mid late twenties, spooky adult horror story of just, you know, shit happens unexpected, but I'm like, I'm, I'm, you know, could have been a lot worse. I'm glad my car is okay and fixable. And I'm glad, you know, my cat is okay. And it seems like in the grand scheme of things, knock on wood, this will hopefully be pretty minor. Um, so let's get into this week's books. Um, the first one that we are talking about is The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. Um, so Alex Harrow, this is her second novel. Um, the first one is called something January. I might pull it up. Should have had this pulled up ahead of time. Yes. Um, it is called The 10,000 Doors of January, uh, which I actually just coincidentally read a few weeks before this, maybe like a month before this. Um, and it didn't make it on the podcast. I mean, it was a really good, rich fantasy world novel. I think just at the time there was too many other books. Um, like I said, you know, follow me on Goodreads because there are quite a few four-star books that I read and just unfortunately don't make it to the podcast, whether they don't fit the theme, whether there were just like too many books that week. Maybe I'll get to it in another time, but that doesn't mean I didn't not like the book. Um, but back to the Once and Future Witches. Um, so speaking of the Salem Witch Trials, we're sort of um, 200 years after we, this book take place in 18... 93, um, there's three sisters, um, the Eastwood sisters, James, Juniper, Agnes, and Beatrice Belladonna, so like perfect witchy names. Um, and it's sort of, you know, not like a modern day take on the Salem Witch Trials, it's in the 1800s, but it's, they live in New Salem, and it's kind of, again, what happens when a community recognizes some otherness and some potential magic and witchcraft and decides to wholeheartedly fight and punish those women, um, there's, you know, a lot about the devil and actual magic in this. It is quite the fantasy novel, um, but definitely rooted in that sort of sisterhood um, love and bond in a way that, you know, the sister, the three witches is famous, you know, back to Macbeth and Hocus Pocus. And these three sisters are definitely, they use their love and their bond and their power for good. Witchcraft is definitely, you know, it's not white magic, but it's definitely not black magic or dark. We sympathize with the witches. They are the ones that we care about. Um, and sort of just the way that magic is explored is very unique in this. It's not very, it's, you know, there's the supernatural fantastical element, but it's still very grounded again in that's in the sisters relationships and in their differing lives and how they have dealt with growing up with magic um so it's like a little bit you know practical magic ish i would definitely you know compare it to that much more than hocus pocus um but it's kind of you know it begs the question of the once and future witches like witches have existed in some form or another um there's another book i highly recommend called waking the witch um which is a non-fiction book but all about the exploration of the witch in history and in contemporary culture, um, especially exploring a lot more recent stuff about witch and witchiness. Um, so I really, I think that's by Pam Grossman and I highly recommend that one as well. Um, but this is also just a nice, it's, you know, it's darker, it deals with some magic and some death and like things, but it's overall, I mean, some of the other books we're gonna talk about are a lot darker. So you could do with a little, if you want a slightly lighter sort of just fantasy, witchcraft, not Salem, but has not, you know, the 1690s uh, Salem witchcraft trials, but has that vibe, uh, check this one out. Um, next, we have The Talented Miss Farwell um, by Emily Gray Tedro. Um, found this book because it was on, like, I think an Entertainment Weekly sort of, like, upcoming thrillers list. Once again, got it due to Library Roulette. Um, 
as you can infer from the title, um, it is much in homage to Patricia Highsmith's famous The Talented Mr. Ripley, um, of which I have not read the book, but I have seen, of course, the film, which is wonderful. Um, so this is kind of like a cross between that, but with definitely, you know, less of the sociopathic, like, murdering aspect um, and more of the um, – it's kind of like cross with, like, bad education, that nonfiction HBO um, biopic, bio story – not, not you know historical fiction the non the HBO docu drama whatever I'm blanking on the term like I said been a rough week um that sort of story based on a true story thing with Hugh Jackman and Alice and Janney bad education of you know these are overall good people and Miss Farwell was overall a very one you know she was it all started because she worked for the city and wanted to better the city and make it better and then she dabbled in some art collecting um so she balances those two identities sort of the podunk like parks and recreation leslie nope type vibe um with trying you know working really hard and giving back to the city balanced with this very glamorous cosmopolitan art dealing world um and especially the art dealing world of the 90s and the 2000s um and um that's kind of i guess when the art market was really prominent and had some ups and downs i mean i don't know a ton about it um so it's a thriller. I mean, it's always nice to read a thriller when there's not like a ton of death and murder. You know, the, of course, <laughs> theft and embezzlement are terrible too, but also just to see a nuanced woman where it's not like, you know, by all, no means are her actions admissible, but you kind of get where she's coming from and she means well and just how things can kind of spiral very quickly out of control, as we all know, and, you know, how with the repercussions of one little thing that we think won't be a big deal and all of a sudden it takes over your whole life and how do you balance these two identities? I mean, it's just really well written. It flows well. Um, you kind I mean, you kind of know where it's going, but it's about the journey, not the destination. And it's, um, you know, the rise and fall, of course, of the talented Miss Farwell. Um, so next we have The Searcher by Tana French. Um, Tana French has written a ton of great thrillers. Um, she is an Irish thriller writer. I think her most recent one before this was The Witch Tree or something like that. Um, they're all sort of set in like the Irish UK countryside. Um, she's probably best known for In the Woods or The Trespasser. Yes, The Witch Elm was the last one I read. Um, the Searcher is a little bit different. Um, we deal with a new detective, Cal Hooper, who is a sort of Chicago like deadbeat cop who just wants a change of life and a change of pace and that's what he thinks he gets when he's coming to the Irish countryside um and then um a young local boy asks for his help with a missing brother and before you know it of course he's drawn into the case and so it's definitely a procedural by all intents and purposes um but something with Tana French I mean she's just really great at crafting these ambient scenic worlds that can be a bit rote and ignored when it comes to sort of a mass market thriller. Um, she also really in infuses her characters with a lot of nuance and depth. Um, this one, Cal Hooper, was, you know, definitely that sort of wounded, broken detective type. Um, but if you're into procedural TV shows like Broadchurch or Happy Valley, um, you know, any of uh, Cardinal, there's definitely other British and foreign thrillers that I'm thinking of. But, um, Something that's different than the sort of detective beat cop by the book type thing. And, you know, it's always great to see how the city detective thrust into a rural situation and the different town characters that all come alive in the secrets in the communities. And I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but this is a great intro to Tana French. Um, and then if you do enjoy The Searcher, you can check out her other books. Um, it's like I said, it's great for anyone who loves British procedurals, loves um, slightly moodier ambient detective novels was still definitely a thriller a thrill and a mystery to it but more of a slow burn they're a little longer they're a little less uh i mean they're still quite readable but they definitely require a bit more thought and intentionality with their reading um so check that out if you want a little bit of a heavier um darker thriller mystery novel and next we have Cardiff by the Sea, Four Novellas of Suspense by Joyce Carol Oates. I mean, how could you not love Joyce Carol Oates? Um, like I said in that interview with Rachel Verona Cote, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. Um, I think the first Joyce Carol Oates novel I remember seeing was actually like a young adult novel that may have been rebranded and repackaged, but it had like a white 
cover with green eyes. Um, and of course, you know, she's famous for the short story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Um, which was also turned into a really great, like, sort of gritty indie 80s movie with Laura Dern. Um, so Cardiff by the Sea, as the title states, is four novellas of suspense and in varying degrees. And I think it's, I mean, Joyce Carol Oates is a master of writing. She's a master of the literary and the, the uncanny and the sweeping discomfort horror um, and, you know, horror without it being overt horror too, like the, the mundane horrors. Um, each of these novels is, you know, carries that same style and that same authorship, but is so vastly different that they, I mean, they're all previously unpublished. They were all, I mean, I don't think they were written with a specific intentionality of being for this collection. I think they were just things she'd written at some point or another that hadn't been published and then all happened to fit together. Um, the first novella is, um, what is it called? <laughs> So good, right? Um, oh, the first one is called Cardiff by the Sea, um, and it is about a young woman who inherits a house after her grandmother died, um, her biological grandmother. She was adopted, and her great aunts lived there. And you can tell right away that like it's just very weird, and like something's not right, but you can't quite place your finger on it. Like that sort of looming discomfort um that ends with a bang and then the best one um or my favorite one of it was called meow dao um mia is a young girl who falls in love with this feral cat who becomes like her familiar um and as she grows up and becomes a young woman how meow dao um plays a role in her life and how you know becomes more than just her companion and about a young girl's blossoming sexuality um and the you know, the becoming a woman and also the the loneliness is very prevalent in this one as well. Um, the next one is called Phantom, Phantom Wise, 1972. Um, a young college student gets pregnant um, after having an affair with her professor um, and then actually falls in love or has this weird relationship, student mentor relationship with another much older um, man professor at the university. Um, so sort of deals with that discomfort of you know, the woman as object versus woman as a person, um, the secret pregnancy, the sort of, you know, grooming and taking control of somebody older than you. Um, especially, you know, there's very much the me too is prevalent, especially, you know, in a little bit in Meow Dao, of course, um, but this one especially as well. Um, and then the surviving child um, is about what happens when your mother, uh, Stefan, is a young boy. Um, his mother is a famous poet who kills herself um, and how he survives in that aftermath. Um, and he believes he's haunted by her, but whether that's more of a metaphorical or an actual physical tangible haunting kind of remains to be seen. Um, but if you're familiar with Joyce Carol Oates' style, it should come as no surprise to you that once again, she knocks it out of the park. And if you're not, this might be a nice little intro. Um, this is her most recent work, but she has work spanning back to the 70s, if not sooner. Um, so it's a nice little introduction to her catalog. Each of these is a full complete novella, so it's a little bit meatier and longer than a short story, although I'm not sure of the specific parameters that defines those. So there's definitely some crossover, but it's, again, if you're short on time or you're new to the reading game, this is a great one to pick up because in its entirety, it's less than 300 pages. So it's very achievable to have read the whole thing. And then you can break it into the four chunks of the novellas. Um, so you can, you know, tackle one novella a night or one novella in two or three nights um, and then feel complete having read that full story. And then once you, you know, tackle all four of them, you'll have tackled this whole novel and then you'll have unleashed the Joyce Carol Oates canon, um, and you can explore some other of her works if you enjoyed it. So, moving on to our next spooky read. Um, if only I could, like, put in music. I mean, I could probably, like, figure that out in, like, non-copyrighted stuff, but, like, it's only fun if it's, like, the real music and we don't want to deal with all that. So, anyways, next we have The Devil and the Dark Water by Stuart Turton. Um, this is another sophomore novel. Um, Stuart his first novel, um, it was called The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hargrove, Hargrave, something, Evelyn Hardcastle, close, that was close, um, which is a really, really cool, like, mystery, twisty thriller where we have to find out, it's like Clue, but like, we have to find out who the killer is, but every day the person or our subject, like, wakes up in somebody else's body and, like, has to figure out who it is and repeating the same day, so it's kind of, like, Groundhog Day, too, so it's, like, he definitely has a grip on being fresh and innovative in the mystery thriller community because there is a lot more uh, historical fiction. I don't know, not historical. I mean, he just really, he cements 
his stories very clearly in a unique time and place and unique concept. Um, but he comes in like wholeheartedly knowing. I feel like a lot of writers sometimes have their ideas, but they don't have the full confidence and ability to write behind it. And he definitely does. Um, so it's kind of like Titanic, but um, like more of a horror movie than a love. I mean, <laughs> Titanic is horrifying, but the love story drama, just tragedy component of it. This is definitely more of like a horror story. Um, so we have a fictional country, or we have the country of Amsterdam, um, and then we have a bunch of passengers on this ship um, going to a fictional country. Um, and there is a detective um, being transported on this ship who then like unleashes a weird omen. And then from that, the rest of the crew feels like their journey is cursed. Um, throughout the novel, people do mysteriously die. Um, feel like they're haunted by the spirit old John who is like possessing the crew. So it's very much told from the perspective of the crew members, a few of the higher ranking passengers who are on board. Um, we get to know different, you know, left. We get to know the ship and the community on the ship through the different perspectives that we get. We also, like I said, we get that um, Detective Samuel Pipps. Um, we get Arendt, who is his companion traveling with him um, and becomes sort of like our stand-in for the audience. So there's definitely like, people are dying. What's the mystery going on? There's also sort of like that fun historical 1600s journey. So definitely this was, you know, not Titanic was in the 1900s. So to take a cross-country journey in the 1600s, I mean, if it sank and the 1900s how do they even get across um and then there's a really really great like lost feel to the last third um i won't give too much away but you can probably infer from that that there is some sort of island um and it's a really gr it's a very confident ending and one that you can kind of see coming but is not super super obvious which i always appreciate and leaves you guessing and kind of leaves you it doesn't remove you so much from the story wanting to know that what happens because you're like, okay, whatever is going to happen, clearly he's confident about it and I will be too. And so it's a good one, you know? <laughs> and lastly, but certainly not least, we have Dark Archives, a librarian's investigation into the science and history of books bound in human skin by Megan Rosenblum. And yes, the title is exactly what it states. Um, there are books out there made of human skin. Um, and it's pretty gross and creepy. I mean, it's, you know, back to Hocus Pocus. There's traditionally, like, that's one of the more, uh, you know, known examples in pop culture of sort of like a book made of skin. And there's horror movie examples. And it's sort of like a gross, creepy thing. But, you know, why did people do it? And so Megan Rosenblum, who I, like, want to be best friends with, um, she is a like archival study she so this is like a part science study and part historical study because of course there's like the testing aspect that comes along first you have to determine whether or not these books are actually made out of human skin which is like the first battle um and more often than not they aren't but it's not so much about the like whether or not they aren't as to why because even if they aren't you know the fact if it's revealed that it's not it's been thought of as a human skin book for hundreds and hundreds of years potentially so she explores the history into some very specific um cases of this that she uses to kind of you know support her larger thesis and support a look into this fascinating world of binding books and human skin and the history behind it and certain books you know why they were you know there's one chapter there's a rumor that a book um was made out of the skin of crispus crispin addicts from the boston massacre um and so she explores that she gets to explore different libraries um and so you just learn a lot i mean as a bibliophile i love learning about books and i love you know cool editions and signed copies and all that i definitely would not want one bound of human skin even if it was just you know sort of for posterity's sake um but why do people you know how do we something like a, a remain you know how did, how does this come in i don't know what i'm saying but you know like how, how there's a lot of books you know bound in like animal hides and flesh and you know why is that okay and human skin it's there's you know something about of course that human connection and that human skinness to it um so it's also, you know, reclaiming the negative stereotypes about death and also sort of the embracing and the somewhat positive aspects, because despite the creepiness of it, not everything about a human skin bound book is creepy. And so it's a really cool, like, 
you'll learn a lot. You'll she goes on a journey throughout the country, um, exploring or actually no throughout the world, um, exploring, getting to explore these extremely rare books and these rare collections and coming into contact with a bunch of cool people and sort of just starting the conversation or exploring this um, phenomenon that really hasn't been touched upon too much. Um, and the fact that it all, she's been doing this research and is probably still working on it right now, um, just culminates in this really, really well-written book for either lovers of science and history and macabre stuff and lovers of books. Um, it's the perfect, you know, it's the perfect spooky season read. So, um, between my own real life horrors and between these horrors, hopefully something has st struck your inspiration for spooky season, which despite what other people say is definitely continuing past Halloween. Um, but I do hope you had a wonderful Halloween, however you celebrated it. Um, and until next time, keep reading. Bye.